man, you know, I was gonna burn my camera guy. Last year he went ballistic up here. He did stuff that like scared the adults. I don't know where it came from. Seriously, he's like, yeah, give it up. And you do need to give it up. Give it up for Aesop for putting this stuff on. This is a lot of fun. This, and this is for you. It's for you. Hopefully I don't screw this up. I'm like 40 hours late to get in here. Seriously, 40 hours late. I'm sorry I'm late to class. The airline ate my homework like six times in boarding passes. It was a joke. Uh, anyway, we got here late, late, late last night. And we're going to do this presentation, and our material has changed multiple times. And I'm glad that Mr. Scott Robbie, I'm honored to present with Mr. Scott Robbie. He's part of the elite crew, hails from Houston, Texas. Give it up for this gentleman right here. A wealth of knowledge. I am in awe of his skill level. I'm scared to be around him sometimes. You have to do a little weld off thing. He asked me recently to approve some material for his school. They're going to start down in the Houston area. And uh, it kind of blew me away that he would consider me. And I got to sign all that and submit it to the Texas uh, Workforce Commission. Yeah. And then I signed a piece of paper this morning. I was like, wow, wow. Anyway, I'm honored to do that, sir. So uh, we talked about, we had some conference calls. And I hope you got all your notes and stuff, what we're going to present, right? No, I don't got no notes. You didn't bring anything? No. I thought you had it. Uh, Shit. Oh, man. Uh, hey, uh, what are you here for? Uh, it's good. Uh, but what are you here for? What are you, what's this session all about? MIG weld. Basic okay, MIG weld. MIG weld, basics of MIG welding, yep. which entails what? Hardwire MIG. Hardwire MIG, we can do that. What all does it entail? Technique. When I say entail, we need to set up the machine, right? Yeah, technique, machine settings, uh, gas settings, flow rate, everything from A to Z. Well, you're naming off a lot of stuff. I thought you said you was going to be basic. Man. Come on. So you're talking about input Sorry, power. You. You're talking about input power. You're talking about output power. You're talking about gases, hardwire, polarity, uh, components of the gun. What? Now late. A lot. Okay. Consumables. Consumables, yeah. It's all important. All right. Well, Scott, let's start from ground zero. Okay. We're going to set up a machine. What do we have over here? We have a... Uh, we got the ESAB Rebel 285. We have the ESAB Rebel 285. It's got uh, pretty much a heavier duty Rebel. I have one of these at my house. It does wonders. I got a bunch of nicknames. Some of them are repeatable in public, actually. Wow. Let me repeat that. I have a lot of nicknames. Some of them are actually repeatable in public. Uh, and, you know, they all kind of relate back to being old for some reason. I don't know why. I've been into this for 45 years. I started my career <clears throat> in northern Oklahoma, Ponca City, Oklahoma, which you spent some time around there as well, right? Born and raised. I was born in Oklahoma City. I uh, spent some time in Pahuska. My dad was in the oil business in Osage County, Oklahoma, which is 45 miles east of Ponca City. So we kind of hail from the same area. Anyway, I, you know, 45 years, and people ask me, what's changed? What's changed since I've been in the welding business, since I've been in this career? And I, a lot of times I say, nothing. Nothing's changed. Carbon's still carbon, oxygen's oxygen. And, okay, all right, I'll do that. Uh, you know, all the elements are the same. Uh, you know, and we've developed some super alloys and stuff. I'll tell you what's changed is machines and high speed electronics and stuff and how we drive, uh, how we shape the arc and what we do to drive filler metal into the, into the joint configurations. And so, it, you know, along the way we, we have refined components and we're putting together a MIG machine over here. We've got incoming power. But what type of power supply does MIG use? Anybody tell me? For $100, anybody tell me? Uh, time's up, by the way. It's constant voltage. Uh, your stick welder is constant current. So with a stick welder, you know, how do you set your voltage on a, on a stick welder? Well, you don't. It's a function of your arc length and your, your, the rod you're running and everything. With MIG welding, the basics of MIG welding, 
it's constant voltage. You set your voltage, you control your voltage and your amperage. What, where's your amperage at? It's a function of your wire feed speed, is it not? It's also a function of the type of gas you use. For short circuit MIG, we want got a, a couple of gases that we can use for short circuit MIG. What are they? That you got, a, you got a, a very popular blend of argon CO2, 75% argon, 25% CO2. You got straight CO2. Is it any different than what you use at the gas station to make a soft drink? No, same CO2. Those two you can short circuit and do a globular transfer, correct? From there, we have a roll of wire. We have E70S6 is very popular. E70S2, anybody know the difference of those? An S2 sounds like it's got a bunch more than an S6, right? It's the other way around. S2 wire has minor amounts of uh, zirconium, aluminum, and titanium, is that right? For deoxidizers. An S6 wire has silicone and manganese. That's where they grab impurities from the weld pool. That's that brown baby glass thing. Are you going to be all right? No. Golly. That's me that dropped it. Uh, so we have, we have things going on in the wire. We have a contact tip that energizes the wire as it leaves the gun. We are predominantly on DC EP reverse polarity, always for hard wire. Is everybody good with that? Are you sleeping in class? Ooh, you wake up. I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, so when you're welding, what do you control? I'm going to set the voltage and the wire feed speed. Uh, there's going to be a relation to the amperage there. What are you controlling? You going to do anything? I'm going to control that trigger right there. The uh, trigger? Well, usually what I do is I set the heat, whatever I, whatever heat I need for the thickness of metal, and then I control the wire speed to make sure that it's all set properly. Okay. He's going to set his machine up the way he likes it, but when he gets to welding, he is actually controlling. We have, we have this thing called electrical stick out, and it's how far the, the contact tip is away from the work. That's the one thing you control. Yeah, That's not, it's not a constant. What else you control? Gun. The angle of the okay. gun, right? How much gas is going into the gun? Gas is preset. I'm gonna set your gas at 20, 20 cubic feet per hour, 20 to 25 cubic feet per hour. There's, there's two other things that he controls. What are they? Technique. technique is one. You better have the right technique today. <laughs> no, you don't come up in here and have questionable technique. One other thing, what is it? Back row. Huh? Speak up, I'm deaf. Travel speed. Ah, there you go. Travel speed. Correct. Correct. So, there's actually four things that you're going to control. All right. We ready? Common welds. Common welds. Uh, how many of you weld for a living? How many of you are just starting out welding? Welcome to the show. Welcome to the game. We honor you for sure. Uh, just starting out. How many of that? This sounds overwhelming with all these variables, doesn't it? Okay. And then when you pull the trigger and make a weld, what are you actually doing? You're going to look at it, right? And then are you going to be unhappy with it? You're going to be happy with it? What's going to happen if you're not? Well, as soon as you raise your hood and you look at a weld, what are you doing? You are now into the non-destructive testing game, folks. You are an inspector, okay? You're an inspector. You pull the trigger, you, you raise your hood, you're gonna inspect your own well. Visually, you're looking at things, and you look at the parameters of uh, what's allowable, you know? What am I looking at? Is it a good weld, is it a bad weld? If you wanna get better, what are you gonna do? I want you to get better. If I'm your instructor and you're in my class, I want you to be better. You're going to have to be here. I'm running off. Uh, how are you going to get better? Well, number one, you're going to understand where we're going and what's, you know, how this is graded. And it's real easy. Uh, we don't reinvent the codes. We use the codes, the structural codes, and, and what's allowable. Okay, so we've got, we've got groove wells. We've got fillet welds. So by mentioning that, don't we, end, don't we need to understand the wells? I hope so. There's parts to a, to a well, is there not? Oh, you got a uh, crown. Is that crown cut? Okay. Scott's up here saying uh, there's toes, there's legs, 
there's faces, there's throats. How many throats are there? That's a weird one. How many of you are inspectors, CWIs, CWEs? Oh, dang. Oh. Uh, the throats are confusing, are they not? There's an effective throat, an actual throat, a theoretical throat of a fillet weld. Is that confusing? Keep it simple. The leg is the size, horizontal or vertical. The toe is anywhere that parent metal uh, reaches the weld metal. Okay, and so you need to look at all those to get better. Here's my suggestion, and I've been fielding this question a lot lately. I don't know why. Uh, people write me on Instagram or however they want to get a hold of me, but it's like they're trying to get better and they're describing this big old long situation. And I'm going, hey, give me your phone number. I mean, I love your question. I'm going to answer it if I can. I don't know everything, but I'll try to answer it. I'm not going to type all that back out. I'd rather talk to you, you know. And I have time when I'm driving to Wichita or somewhere an hour away. And, and so I'll talk to people. Here's my suggestion. Here's what it boils down to. If you're just starting out and you're in the game, uh, you're going to be doing fillet welds, you know, all kinds of structure welds and groove welds and pipe welds. Print yourself a WPS. Make 20 copies minimum. I mean, <clears throat> sketch out your weld. Sketch out and write down all your essential variables of what you're doing. Change one at a time. Don't change a bunch of them. Just change one or two at a time. And then keep track of it. Man, it's like you're already focused. I joke with my students, write it, write it on the inside of your hood. If you're not going to listen to me, you know, write it on the inside of your hood. But pay attention to these numbers because they matter. An eighth of an inch of electrical stick out matters. One volt matters on a groove pipe weld uphill, does it not? You know? All right, so. Oh, ex yeah, exactly. Uh, I've seen, you know, everybody, you know, I'll, I'll shoot a picture or something. They say, oh, you welding too cold. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, or, yeah, or it could be welding too hot. But they dog my numbers, you know. They see my machine set up and they dog my numbers. Uh, okay, dog my numbers all you want. How do you know what my machine is actually putting out? How do you know the internal temp of my coupons? What's going on? You know, leave me alone. I've been doing this. Well, I don't know everything, but I don't like making repairs either. So, uh, we're going. Do we have everything set up for? What's the first weld you want to make? Uh, we'll just do a uh, flat T joint. Okay, we're going to do a common T joint. Mm -hmm. So on an, on an ESOP Rebel 285, 035 wires, uh, C25 gas, is that what you're running? Yep. Or going carbon dioxide. You want to trust the crowd for your numbers or you, you want to go with it yourself? I say, I say no, get the crowd involved. Yeah, let's here. try the crowd. Okay. See, see how right they are. Uh, five, is that 516 or quarter inch material? Let's go quarter, quarter inch, inch material. Uh, anybody want to set his voltage for him? What is it? 18. Is that what you said? Dude, I, one more time, I'm dead. 18 volts. 18 volts? Yeah. Okay. All right. The gentleman says 18 volts. Okay. The gentleman says 18 volts. I like it. Uh, what do you got going on here, dog? You're in stick mode. Oh, yeah, we need to go back. We need to change from stick. Yeah, rookie mistake. I had to set up. Mig. Mig mag. Uh, what's that term mag? Where did that come from? Anybody know? Metal active gas. Has anybody looked up the history of welding? Have you gotten bored one night and Googled up on uh, the history of welding? Anybody? Why not? You're on the phone all the time anyway, dog. I know you are. Uh, look it up sometime. It's really kind of interesting. I mean, there's stuff going on in the 1800s. Anybody want to set the wire feed speed for him? I got 18 volts. 330? How much? 230. 230, he says. Okay, I'll go with that. What's this one say? What do you want? 230, 300. 200, 300. What do you want? Uh, we'll, we'll go between the two of you there and go 245. Is there anything else we can set on this machine? 
that would help him out. Did we set his gas? Yep. Pull the trigger, dog. I did. Oh, hold it. I did. Uh, you guys ain't on. You didn't turn that cylinder on? No, I did. A novel concept right there. Hey, anytime you walk up to the cylinder and turn it on, turn it on real slow, please. It's just a good habit to get into. All right, carry on. Turn, give me something here. What do you want this at? 25, 20? Yeah. There's no wind in here. Well, if I'm paying for it, 15. Yeah, if you're paying for it, 15. I like to turn the gas down low. I like to turn it just above where there's no porosity. How many of you like grinding porosity out of welds? Nobody? Love I hate it. it. I hate it. it. All right, is there anything else? We've got gas, we've got bolts, we've got amperage. Anything else we want to get involved with on this machine? On any machine, for that matter. Anybody heard of a little uh, sweetheart called inductance? Anybody know what it is? No? Well, it's good stuff. What do you think it is? What do you think it has an effect on? Is it like an oven? It's like what? An oven? It will, it, it's like another, just to put it in simple terms, like another current uh, or another circuit that goes over and it will affect the rate of transition or in short circuiting work. That's what it's doing, it's short circuiting. Um, it'll soften up that effect and that, that raspy, heavy BB sizzle sound. That is actually, that's actually shortened out 50 to 200 times a second. And that's what you hear. People say uh, the proper settings, it sounds like bacon. I want to know what kind, because I like bacon, bacon, bacon. It sizzles, and that's what we're used to hearing, is that raspy sound. Well, inductance, will soften up that weld pool. Uh, the higher the number on most machines, if you, if you go in and set 45, 50, 60%, the weld pool seems wetter and softer. And if you turn it all the way down, it's real crispy and hard and has more spatter. Does that make sense to you? We have that capability on this machine. What is the range? I don't know that we can, I believe it's probably preset. On this particular machine, we can we're in the MIG mag setting. We can go, oh, come on, stop it. Uh, we're gonna go here and go up to parameters, up the top, and right now it's at 50%. And we're gonna leave it there. I think this is when we get the wire and voltage set where we like this on this machine, that 50% will be nice. And so we just leave it there. And I'll turn this back down to home and go from there. Are we ready to pull the trigger? No, we are. Yep. It's on. Okay, I hope you have the right settings in here. Let's see. Where's my bolt guy? There he is. Uh, who's arguing about wire feed speed? You two? Okay, 230, 330. 300, 300. 800, 600. Let's do it. What happens if well, you don't uh, have your ground? We did not have that ground I've been hooked trying up. to do this for 45 years. I have been trying to weld without a ground for 45 years. It doesn't work. Well, we can However, try. I do have a nice story for you. I was plasma cutting in my shop. I use a turntable to cut coupon to pipe out. It takes me 30 seconds to whittle out a piece of six inch pipe. And I'll take the plasma cutter and put it on a track torch over on the burn table. I came back over to the turntable and I'm even paying attention. I'm making cuts on the pipe. It's working, but it's like, man, there's something not right. I got a bad tip or something. I got up out of my chair, I went to look over it. First thing I was gonna check was air pressure. And I came, I turned around, the ground wasn't even on the turntable. It was over here on the turntable, but I was making cuts. So I was close, but I've never been able to weld without a ground. I keep trying. Did you get her hooked up there, baby? Oh yeah, everything's running. Huh? Everything's running. Good deal. All right. Do it, man. How big a weld should you make on quarter inch material for a T weld fillet? Single pass. Thickness of the metal. Engineering wise, we go slightly smaller, 3 16 on both sides. How many of you are critical about the size of your weld as an inspector? You want it to be consistent, right? Somebody said travel speed a while ago. A gentleman back there said travel speed. See, I'm I got a memory, I don't know what's going on. Uh, travel speed affects your 
width of your weld, does it not? It's kind of the size of your weld. Whether you push or you pull, and Scott likes to, you can tell he grew up in Talk City, Oklahoma, because he's got a little pause. And there's some people that incorrectly call that a whip. Uh, we'll fight later. Don't call that a whip. That's just like a, you know, a whip and name that or something. It's not a pause. It's a pause, that's all it is. It's called, I like to call it a stitch. Ian does it. You see, you see people that do, you call it that stacking dime effect. It is a slight manipulation of the wire. Uh, we're not doing crazy stuff here. We got kind of a black and white. Let me verify this well. Oh man, that even smells good. Uh, that's pretty good condition. So you picked the voltage correctly. You dialed in the wire feed speed pretty nicely. We're not going to change the gas. Uh, do we want to show different effects of what happens? Yep. Yeah, okay. Do, uh, too much wire. Okay. I'm only, I'm only going to change one thing at a time. Remember, I said one thing at a time. Pay attention. And, and by the way, you got to when you're doing this WPS and you're training yourself, you want to change one thing. Got to pay attention to your manipulation of your pool. Right now, he's going to use the same thing all the time. He's, he's like me. He grew up with a little TikTok motion. And that's all it is. I can't do one of these welds where you just pull the trigger and move smooth. Can you? I can't. I don't move that way, man. I'm, I, I mean, I start a weld like that, and I'm trying to be perfectly still. It looks like I'm getting ready to pull over by the highway patrol. I'm shaking uncontrollably. You give me my TikTok motion back, and I'm good. So we want to change the wire feed speed. Going up or going down? He says going up. <laughs> All right, dog, here you go. Uh, I went from 245 to, I'm gonna go. I went from 245, I'm gonna go 350, 345. Let's go up 100 inches a minute. And, you know what, while you're welding, I'll just keep going up. At some point in time, we're gonna lose control here. And I may be incorrect in teaching this, but this is this is my theory on, on how this works and everything. I like to think of voltage as a liquefying effect, okay? Because I can keep adding more wire, more wire, more wire, and eventually I'm gonna crap him out here and it's just gonna start going everywhere. Okay. I, I heard him. And it's going to happen, and that is at, uh, uh, it's reading, and that's at 390, so way above. It, and that is a testament to the machine, by the way, it really is. Uh, if I turned that inductance down, you probably would have lost that way earlier, mm -hmm. is what I'm thinking. So this is what I like to... Huh? Yeah. Uh, gas metal arc welding, rig welding requires a good ground. I like to think of voltage as a liquefying effect, and I like to think of amperage as like the drying effect. They, they both have to go with each other. There is no ratio. Is, there's not an exact ratio, okay? I've never seen an exact ratio that goes with it. It's kind of a common sense thing, and I've always set machines by looking at them. I just told you I was old. I grew up in the days of hand crank, you know, and we're moving the coil past another coil, and I'm looking at an analog meter, old time meter. Hey, you too young, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm looking at the weld pool. You know, you're listening and you're watching the weld pool. Well, there's times you can't even listen to it. It's so loud in the shop, you've got people grinding, uh, there's things going on. You gotta really pay attention to what's going on with the weld pool, okay? All right, so we established the baseline at 18 volts. We were at 240-something, 245. Let's round it off to 250, can't we? Yep. Okay. You know? What's What's a couple of inches of, of wire feed speed amongst friends there, Scotty? Mm -hmm. A couple of old oaky boys like us. Uh, so if we, if we stayed the same baseline and took the wire down, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You're going to get a little longer arc length. The weld pool is going to stay fluid. We're not really adding anything to it. Okay? You want to try that? Yeah. Oh, we go pretty quick here. Uh, how many of you have looked at footage of, uh, yeah, go ahead. 
How many of you looked at footage where multitask is now? I'm talking, you're welcome, and we're telling the stories. Boy, you ain't getting paid for none of it, man. Uh, at 240, I'm dropping down to 200, going into the abyss of 170, down to 150. You hear this? You hear what's going on? Kind of getting a heavy pop here. Just. How many of you have looked at, at footage of what's actually going on with gas metal arc welding? How many of you have ever run or been around a like there's an old time machine, a millimatic 200, CP200. Anybody ever seen one of those? Like circa 1970s machine. CP, by the way, stands for constant potential or three phase. It's third letter of the alphabet. I went to school in Oklahoma. Yeah, that's right. Three phase machine. Usually married with a, a 10E feeder, but the whole trick, the whole thing about that is. You can take that feeder and turn it to zero. It still has a little bit of wire coming out. Yeah, you can set this thing about 24 open circuit volts to where you would do some short arc. And it's, the wire's coming out at such a speed, it's perfect for teaching this. The wire comes down and bumps into the grounded material and starts burning back this little ball and it falls off. It's like the most beautiful live slow motion demo you could ever do for yourself. Seriously, and, and you understand what's going on with wire feed speed that way. Okay. You can hear the difference on that one. Right? When we start dropping it, 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 yeah, it just got soft. Yeah. Okay. We haven't changed anything but wire feed speed. Yeah. I'm going to go back to your baseline, sir, 250 on the wire feed speed, 18 volts. And now we're going to do this kind of the same thing. What happens here is. If I turn his voltage down, it's like it's like me turning the wire up. It's going to happen way sooner. Okay, he, not, he doesn't have that liquefying effect when I get him down to probably 16 volts. Is it going to his machine probably start crapping out? I don't know. Let's give it a go. Give it a go, Snoop. All right. Reading 18.2 to start with, right at 18. 115 volts is what this wire feed speed relates to, by the way. You're at 17, sir. No, now you're down at 16. This is hard to do on the fly. Uh-oh. I fell out of, oh, stop it. You look like me, man. Oh, no, I think that's... Hey, I didn't going. turn that back up. I did not turn that back up. It says 20. No, I bumped it. It says 14, too. All right, let's do something. We were at 18. I'm going to go 16, 5. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to go a volt and a half at a time. Pull the trigger, please, right. sir. What do you hear? What do you see? I hear it being tighter, uh, a little sharper. Okay, stop, please. Stop. Uh, I'm gonna go down a volt and a half. We're down at 15 and 250. We lost it. See, that's what I'm saying. It's hard to do on the fly. I think the machine is trying to compensate for stuff. That's, you gotta give it up for these machines. I swear these things are so smooth, so smart. Uh, you know. I, the technology and machines and electronics is fascinating to me. So, you know, we lost it right away. And we're talking about small numbers. We're talking about small changes here, are we not? We're talking about a volt, volt and a half. It's like, wow, that's a minor change. Well, it makes a big deal, you know? To me, it does. All right, so we're at 250. We go back up to our baseline of 18. And from there, uh, I'll go up a volt and a half. I'll go to 19.5. And again, this doesn't sound like a big change, but man, I noticed it standing right here. You, I don't know what you hear, uh, but to me, it's like a heavy pop. Yeah, we got this. We got this liquefying effect. Stop for a second there, sweetie. Is there any way? Are you pulling that quite a bit or pushing it? That one's pulled. Okay. Uh, go straight in with your angle so the crowd can see a little better, please. 
Uh, let me, yeah, there you go. All right. We got more pop yet. More fluidity on top of the pool. The arc length is getting longer. Okay. A lot more spatter. A lot more heavy spatter, he says. How many of you like uh, whittling off the dingleberries, the chingaderas, the spatter off your plate and stuff? No fun, is it? No fun at all. Okay. So I'm going to go up to, let's go up to 22 and a half and leave your wire feed speed where it was. How many of you? Oh, dog, that don't sound right. Oh, man, I think you need to, you need to go clean up. Sometimes this works. Sometimes you'll need this effect right here. It's more of a liquefying effect, but we're not laying down a lot of crown on top of the metal. Yeah, it's a little flatter. It's fusion, okay, not a buildup. A while ago I talked about a setting is like the super slow motion that you could do live. I taught a lot of classes for the state of Oklahoma and I did some in Ditchwitz, Perry, Oklahoma, Charles Machine Works. Remember that? We kind of know Ditchwitch as directional boring and stuff. I taught classes in there. I was in sales at the time and we were trying to, I was trying to impress upon them that we don't need to have parts go travel all over the plant three or four miles before they get done. You know, let's build a manufacturing cell. We're smart enough to bring raw stock in, cut it, prep it, fit it, weld it, and be done with a hydraulic cylinder or something right there in an area this big. You know, we don't need to have we don't need to be transporting them all over the place. So my job was kind of to teach uh, as, uh, machinists and assembly people the arts of the skills of welding and stuff. And they had a particular weld down there that was like a real heavy, uh, heavy piece of stock, and it had a piece of sheet metal that, that came up to it. And they tried all these different settings and, and all this labor-intensive time. I know what they wanted. They wanted something low profile. And we somehow we were discussing it one night, and I said, "Well, just turn our feed speed down all the way." Why? They want to go fast, man. I think production, you know. So they do that, and then they got all this grinding and shaping and all this other crap they were doing. It's like it was like a waste of time. They think that this process that I described was slow, but it ended up saving them a lot of time. It gave them the profile they wanted. It gave them the fusion they wanted, and they're going. You know, we were thinking the wrong direction here, you know, so understand what's going on with the weld pool, you know, make your proper adjustments or make the adjustments you want. Uh, we just crawled up into 22 and a half volts. We left the wire feed speed alone. Where are we as far as the metal transfer? What are the four main metal transfers? Where's my guy? He's on the back row. What's the four main metal transfers of gas metal arc welding or MIG welding? I heard him, uh, he lip syncing back here. I see pulse. Huh? Spray. Pulse. Pulse spray, actually, yeah. Huh? Short circuit? And? Uh, I'm not going to repeat it until you tell it right. Globular. 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 Spell that wrong on my test. Uh, globular. So, and a lot of people like that. A lot of people like that globular thing. That's why I asked you like to chisel BBs off your welds and stuff. I don't, you know. Uh, do you remember Fairview, Oklahoma? Okay, yeah. uh, two companies in Fairview, Oklahoma. And I was, one of them I was trying to get into, brutal to get into this place. I was wanting to go in and sell some stock, you know, wire, gas, all that stuff. <clears throat> I finally got in this place. It was. Brutal. I, you know, I'm, I go to dinner at five, or breakfast five o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna find a foreman or something. I'm gonna get in this account somehow. I spent months trying to get in this thing. I finally met a guy that I would, had met over at Ditchwitch. He was he, he was an engineer. He went over and started working the place. I finally get in. I take a tour of this place. They are just coming out of the dark age. Do what you want, dog. Are you okay? Uh, scaring me. Uh, they were just coming out of the dark ages of stick welding. They had a cool product, articulated steering sweeper. And they were just coming out of the dark ages. They were welding the pure CO2. Uh, I don't know who was setting up their machine. It's, it's like they'd make welds 
that were way oversized, way oversized, and then they spent hours chiseling BBs and grinders and all this stuff before they went to paint booth with it. I'm going, wow. I walk through there and I go up to his office and he goes, what do you think? I said, you guys need a little seminar. You need, you need some instruction on something. He goes, well, what do you suggest? I said, I will charge you $250. I'll bring dinner, but I want the floor foreman, I want somebody from management, and I want the welders there. And I'm gonna weld on your machines. I'm not gonna try to sell you anything on, as far as machines or anything. I just wanna do a seminar. Okay, cool. So I charged them money. And then I went in there and told them, I had nothing to lose. I had nothing to lose in this account. And I said, you guys have a cool product and I love it. I love where you're at. But somebody's gonna kick your butt in the marketplace unless you get it going here. Guess what I took to this demonstration besides dinner with a bunch of good sandwiches? I took a bottle of gas. That's all I took, one bottle of gas which kind of leads us up into our afternoon session. Yeah. How good am I? Just kind of lead ahead there. There's a bottle of gas. Anybody ever heard of like Stargon or Tri-Blend and stuff? You can short arc and spray on the same bottle of gas. That's all I took with me. I may have talked, it, I, maybe it was a bottle of 95.5. You know, they're positioning all their work in the flat and horizontal. That's all I took with me. Old time dinosaur Hobart machine. I mean, this thing looked like a boat anchor for a yacht. It was crusty looking. You, uh, and I took their machine, put my gas on it, adjusted some values and pulled the trigger and I am laying down deep penetrating welds with no buckshot going anywhere and all the welders are going, wow, I like that. All the foremen are going, I don't get it. And all the management's going, I hope I can save some money doing that. And I handed them a piece of paper and said, I think I can save you $50,000 a year easily just by switching gas and going with me. And I'll charge you less for you. I said, by the way, you're, you're way overpriced on your wire right now. Uh, I wasn't there to cut prices. I was there to raise prices. I, I go into an account and do anything with understanding short circuit or any kind of wire feed thing. Scott's the same way. We want you to understand the process so that you can work parameters, weld faster, cleaner, save money. Isn't that why we're in business, is to save money? Time is money, correct. So basically, I went into this account and said, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not happy, you know? You guys are chiseling buckshot, and somebody's gonna come along and steal your product, kick your butt in the marketplace, and I won't get to come over here and feed you dinner anymore for 250 bucks. I barely got into this account. They bought it, they did buy a, a big plasma cutter for me, but when I did the, yeah, I couldn't sell them wire. They just, you know, they didn't want change. They didn't want change. And, and some people are like that, and that's fine. You know, again, you, you can teach them so much, you know, and I have enjoyed the teaching aspect, the knowledge part of it. Uh, you know, we went through a complete setup over here. We welded on quarter inch plate. Scott, uh, that's probably hot, dude. Uh, Scott pulled the trigger on a lot of different parameters here, and it's the same thing that you have and you have available to you. Again, take note. Take note of what you're changing. Take note of how it affects the size of your weld, the depth of, or you look at the fusion and whatnot. Uh, your gun angle shouldn't change. And by the way, when we say push and pull, uh, to me, that is only like, 10, 15 degrees, you know, we're dead zero in one direction, we go 10 or 15 degrees one direction or the other way. Those drastic angles don't really have an effect, do they? Depends on the gas you're using. Uh, simple gas blends, I've been welding for 40 something years and I use about three or four motions in all welding. It doesn't matter what kind of welding I'm doing. Stick, tig, mig, I just try to keep it real simple. But don't ask me to travel smooth, because I just, I look like a schoolboy. It's bad, it's just bad, it's comical. Yeah. Uh, you know, I try to be smooth and methodical and uh, easy going through everything, but really small techniques, you know, I just, we just don't get complicated. I, I've read these tech books, you probably have them, where they got all this complicated big old lacy figure eight and then you go along and one of them's a square and the other one's a small rectangle and then you go to something else. How do you keep track of that? 
Now when I drop the hood, I'm, I'll be I'll get lost in that motion. I don't know who wrote that book. He probably from he probably somebody from Texas or something. I hope he's not here in the audience too. Uh, you know, just keep it simple. You know, we we played around and we we've, we've done all those motions and we look at the welds and you can't tell the difference of which one's which. You can cut and etch and you cannot tell the difference. So why even attempt them? If you like to do that, that's fine. You know, I like to simplify my life. Uh, again, make simple changes. Uh, keep everything constant as far as your electrical stick out. Uh, push and pull. There's not a whole lot of difference there. You will get an effect. Pushing, uh, generally we reserve for the flux core, or I, I take that back, generally for the spray modes, which we're, we're gonna talk about this afternoon. Uh, you know, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Make sure you got a good ground. Make sure you got a good contact tip. There's two conditions in a roll of wire that help make the wire make contact with the contact tip. Does anybody name them? Oh man, this, this is like a money question right here. What do you want to do? You pick somebody up? Who's, there's two conditions in a roll of wire that help the wire make contact with the contact tip. Does anybody know what they are? Yes, sir, you, sir. I'm sorry? The wheels on the inside that uh, push on the wire and feed it out through the ground. You full crap. I mean, uh, no, that's incorrect. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Two conditions. Uh, one, of them start, one, of them, one of them starts with a C, and the other one starts with an H. There's your clue. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes, sir. Colette? The Colette? Nope. I'm not talking about contact tip. I'm talking about the condition of the wire. What makes the wire make contact contact tips rolling through the liner? Cast. Cast is the first one. Has anybody been welding long, minding their own business, everything going good, and all of a sudden your machine just starts crapping out, just going ballistic? And you look at your contact tip and it's worn out. It's got a big oval in it, you know? And so what happens is it's just floating through dead airspace. You know, eventually it's, it's, it's gonna do that, okay? And then, so cast, how many of you have been putting a roll of wire on and you let, accidentally let go of it? And it just flew apart, that's, that's the cast, okay? That's the cast. The other condition is very, very minor, it's called helix. That's the spring effect. I don't even, I don't even consider that, okay? Cast and helix is what make wire Come in contact, the contact tip. We like fresh contact tips, do we not? I love them. I like that effect, you know. I like that good, tight, short arc sizzle control, especially on pipe welds or, uh, you know, any of the outside corner joints or anything we do. It's getting extra on the brand new stuff every day. Yeah, that's good. Uh, keep things clean. You will have, uh, how many of you? don't like material prep. You're too lazy to do material prep. I'm with you. Some, yeah, I mean, it's a mindset sometimes. Uh, you grab a piece of steel and, I mean, it's new. It just came from the yard. It's great. You think it's clean. Huh? You pull the trigger and what happens? It's not digging through it. Just kind of, the weld just kind of sits up on top of it, doesn't it? I wish we both had mics. God, I'd give you this, but you start talking forever. You know? uh, Scott's going to tell me that mill scale will starve the weld pool of its fluidity or wetting effect. Does anybody know what wetting is? Anybody ever wet the pants when they grow up? Anybody know what wetting is? Wetting. We, we, talk about this, we talk about this term of wetting the weld pool into the parent metal bonds, fusion, adhesion. Think of it this way. Uh, go to the grocery store, grab one of those rough paper sacks. You wad it up and you throw it on, a, on top of a bucket of water and it just sits there, doesn't it? Just go ahead and say yes, I'm, I know I'm right. Man. Put a little salt or a speck of soap in that water and slurry it around and dissolve it. Do the same thing and what's that sack? It just dissolves, it just relaxes. It goes. That's a wetting effect. Okay, it's kind of the same way in well metal. Okay. Well, you want, you want a clean parent metal down to clean white metal. You don't have to get real uh, anal retentive about it, but you do want to knock some of that stuff back. Okay. I found a fantastic product for doing that. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, we do projects and we want to maintain the integrity, we want to maintain the surface of the material so we don't want to grind into it, right? We do outside corner joints, we put something up in your office real nice and you paint it and you think, oh, that's real cool. And you walk by and there's a certain angle of light and you go, oh, God, who hammered on my project? You know, it's just beat the daylights. That's from you gouging into it with a grinder. There's a product out, it is uh, diamonds grown on stainless wires. And you turn the RPM like way down and it just, it just chews that stuff right off. They're so cool. Uh, and you, you clean it off and your weld goes way faster, way cleaner. You can drop the values. So you're welding faster, you're welding with less overall heat. I mean, we're going to prove this to you this afternoon, what mill scale does to the weld pool. Okay, it'll starve the weld pool of its fluidity. Remember I said voltage, liquefying effect? Okay. Well, now you got to show up this afternoon to, to hear the rest of the story, you know? Who did, who, who was famous for saying, now you know the rest of the story? Who was that? Come on. See, there's some old guys in here, Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was in my house in Ponca City, Oklahoma in 1970. My mom did the uh, census in Ponca City, Oklahoma, and Paul Harvey came there as part of the Republican Women's Yeah, true story. Yeah, he's kind of a cool guy, too. Where'd you grow up? Yeah, Ponca, where? I don't even know where he lived. Do you remember where the library was downtown? Yeah. Do you remember one block north of that, 210 North 6th? The cracker barrel. Okay. Supposedly, this is the first house built in Punk City. We lived there for a long time. We built it, or we bought it from some people. You know, I think we were the third owners, and we bought it in 1968. Two big two-story house. Uh, my mom was at home one day. Kid knocked on the door said, I think you're living in the first house built in Punk City and gave her a report. The, the guy that built this house did the land run, okay, did the land run, staked his claim, built this house, and lived in it while he was building the Marlin Mansion. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, and he says, oh, wow, because he knows that. Yeah, know. You look at and I'm going, wow, that's a cool report. My dad came home and crawled up in the attic and looked at the original roof. It's crazy, I mean, I, it was kind of, it's kind of weird. This guy was a prolific builder of downtown Ponk City. Anybody ever heard of Continental Oil Company? That's what we're talking about. That's where, Con that's where Conoco started. Three Sands, Oklahoma. Anyway, a little history there. Sorry about that. What else? <laughs> you good? Yeah, I'm good. Well, you got all kinds of stuff here. You, we went through theory. We went through uh, Technique. Uh, we went through heat. You know, we're uh, going to talk about a lot of gas changes. But yep. Not, uh, not many gas changes, but until you get into the technique, like spray, globular, right. pulse, all that. You know, they'll see that. Three. I like to do a lot of projects. Uh, I mean, I built a lot of stuff, you know, outside corners, or even that slight lap where you put that fillet right next to the edge or something. Mm -hmm. Kind of fuse that. Use the use the weld pool to bond everything. <laughs> yep. And I'm, I'm trying to impress upon the fact that you can use minor changes and they have a big effect mm -hmm. on your weld. How far away are you from your welding machine to make adjustments? No, uh, yeah, you're 15 feet. Yep. Yeah. 10, 15 feet. Scott's going Scott's to gonna agree with me on it. Hey, you, yep. like, you like them folks that come in every morning and they go over and they set their machine on where their sharpie marks or their scribe marks are on the mm. front of the machine. I laugh at that. I love that. I watch that. That's comical to me. You know? My favorite is getting in there before they get there and turn yeah. it all the way up. Me too. I'll go in there and mess with them. You know, that, that, that interconnecting cord that goes from the, from the feeder to the gun, the back side mm. of the gun, I pull that thing out just <laughs> enough where it's not making contact. And I'll go over and loosen the drive rolls just enough where the wire's slipping. And I'll walk away and have a little coffee and see how long it takes for them to figure that out. They got to troubleshoot their own machine. Sometimes it takes a long time, you know? It's but like that, breakfast in a show. Yeah. You know, the other thing we're talking about is you got people that walk up and they turn their knobs to these marks on the face of their machine. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and do that. That'll work for you. What happened? What was that all about? 
Well, at a certain temperature, at a certain time of day, uh, when the moon phase was just right, everything lined up, and man, that machine was welding beautifully. They might have had a good contact hit, the whole nine yards. They didn't think anything about power draw, power consumption. I used to go to a plant at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'd be in there by myself. My machine was crispy. I had everything coming to me. As soon as everybody come to work, turn the hair dryers on, turn the microwaves on, everybody making coffee. Man, I gotta, I gotta go over and turn my machine up. You know, power compensation. Now you got machines that do compensate internally, that's good, but understand that. You don't go over and put marks on your machine. Understand the numbers. Understand what you're looking at and what that weld pool delivers at those numbers. Don't put marks on your machine or Scott and I are going to mess with you. Right. I'm going to put a mark on this one for thir 3 o'clock. Okay. All right. I want to thank you for your attendance. We appreciate you being here. Do you have any questions? Hopefully we can answer them. Hopefully. Maybe. Uh, what else? Give it up for Mr. Scott Robbie. And give it up for Esau for putting this on. I think this is really kind of cool uh, that Esau goes to the link to educate, to help under, you know, to help understand all this, all the parameters of what the wonderful world of welding, you know. And they have some great equipment, they have some great people, so give it up for Esau University. Thank you again for your attendance. Appreciate your support and feedback.